Boom. Hey, what up, everybody? What up, Renegades and uh, Chinchilla fans and musicians in general? Um, so the last post uh, about Ren, I don't remember what I seen that day, but something spurred me and inspired me to uh, speak out. It might have been even been something that was happening at school. Um, it's just hard for me to continuously watch uh, the music industry sort of uh, musicians especially to keep kind of living under the same dark cloud of gloom and doom with the value of music bottoming so I kind of threw that together I wasn't exactly organized uh, I didn't go into that oh, let me move this over get a little bit closer there there we go um but it wasn't a planned thing so given the reaction to that one uh i wanted to do a follow-up and be a little more clear on on some of the ideas behind that please understand that this is a very difficult I, I don't want to say topic because to me, having done a bunch of the research, it's many topics. It's like 20 or 30 different um, categories of areas of study. So, but the, I, I, let's get right to the point. So the way that Ren can affect the mu music industry and the way he's setting an example for the new model. And let me be clear with something before I go into that. When I say music industry, I don't mean a boardroom at Capitol Records, you know, the vision that most people have when you say music industry. Everyone says it, and when they say it, what they really mean is the corporate aspect of the music industry which is a very small percentile of what the actual music industry is the real music industry are hundreds of thousands if not millions of musicians all over the world who go out and get a gig the second you walk into a, a bar and you know, play a venue for money or sell something online or post it, you're part of the industry. So there's way more thousands more of that end of the industry than there are, you know, the corporate aspect of the industry. So when I say music industry, I'm encompassing all of that. But I'm especially talking to musicians and producers and people everywhere. So, but anyhow... So the way that Ren is setting this example for us is the first thing is he's proving that there's value to music when people are, are you know, posting comments like they had to go buy a CD player because they didn't own one before buying his CD. Years after CDs have been considered defunct, that's saying something. And um, there were a couple people who thought this spoke about formula or I was trying to extract a formula from Ren. That's not it at all. So I've got some prepared first. I'm going to read this and then it'll be more conversational um, about this. And because I'm old or older, you know, I, I don't care about age. I'm not one of those people that, oh, I think I'm young, you know, or I care that I'm what I am. I don't. So, all right. So, Ren is showing us all that if we are willing to put, if we're willing to put in the work and really understand what it is about music that music lovers find valuable that we can restore value to music. And so regarding formula, 
what happens when you say the word branding is that people's reaction is one of fingernails on the chalkboard. I don't want to say people. There's a lot of people. But musicians and artists especially, if you use any kind of professional or technical terminology relating from the business side about music, instantly everyone has their daggers up and they are out for blood because they think you're devaluing something. And I just want to point out, I want to ask you a question. Do you think maybe... Just maybe that reaction in musicians has anything to do with the devaluation of music, with us not being able to sell product or being able to earn a living doing what we love. Hmm? It might. So, back to my reading here. Um, if it was about formula, you know, what you guys are thinking and, and, and what we all think is that in a few years, there's going to be copycat artists coming out trying to call themselves Sick Dude or The Mental Gambino or, or something to try and copy Ren's image or narrative. And that's not what I'm talking about at all. I'm talking about what the branding pillars are. This is about structure and methodology and this is about the art and science of human connection. It's no different than learning music theory. You learn music theory and music composition to become a, a great musician, but we neglect all the other aspects that go along with connecting with people in a way that is meaningful. You know, and these days, it's exactly what you have to do at every level. You have to put yourself out there and you have to connect. Because one of the things that's happening, and with, with everything that I'm going to say, there are rules. You know, these are our are, are rules. But every rule can be broken. This isn't like, you know a law set in stone that there can be no artists to break this mold ever. No. But the more you understand about the rules, the more empowered you are to break them, but you break them with strategy and with understanding about what you're doing in that moment. But it's not about trying to rip off formula. This is about understanding and identifying what people connect and resonate with and the 10 pillars of from martin lindstrom's book and i'll i'll just do a quick refresher rundown of them and this is by memory i'm not looking at anything with them real quick but it's a sense of belonging sensory appeal grandeur evangelism mystique rituals symbols Stories, sensory appeal, and enemies or juxtaposition. And every mega brand on the planet, every religion, incorporates these 10 pillars into their product, their marketing, and their advertising. Now, this is not to say that every big company does that because there's been this massive misunderstanding on how, what branding is and how branding works. And if you jump on YouTube or you surf the net, you're going to find a ton of people talking about branding and they're going to say things like, you are a brand. And that is not incorrect, but it is incomplete. It doesn't tell the story of how branding functions with us and in another one of these uh i'm not going to do it tonight because i there's quite a bit that needs to be said based on uh comments and and messages and and things that were sent to me after the last post but i'm definitely going to do like an insane clown posse branding breakdown 
And when I do theirs, that'll be the next t- time I post. Uh, I'm also going to do like a wedding breakdown of branding. So you guys can just have some frame of reference to connect this to. But this is really important to artists. And the reason I'm taking the time to come back and revisit this subject is because I want musicians to prosper. There's a lot of change that has to happen. And it, and it's the same reason I came to school. Is I, I realized the ball was on the ground. Someone had to pick it up and carry it over the goal line. And I'm the first... <sighs> There may be others. I don't, I don't want to say I'm the first. I just don't know of the others. I haven't found their research or anything like that. But I realized because of my research and because I understood it and I could see the connection, it was my turn to pick up the ball and run with it. Sacrificing the time and effort that it was going to take, but also giving myself a second chance and a time to start over considering what I've been through taking care of my parents. But So back to Ren. So... When it comes to how these branding pillars work and what branding really is, it's not a superficial thing. It is a deep, deep, soulful journey inside. It is about the abandonment of formula. It is about understanding what it is that connects in an artist or a band or musicians' story in their past that resonates with others. That's why Ren is so powerful. He's not adhering to formula. Now, there are things, and I don't know to what extent that he has done his homework. It's very clear that he's done some reading and some YouTubing, and and he's gone down the rabbit hole. And as I said, I think in the last one, but in some of the comments that, and he, I know he says it, I think it's in heretic, you know, that he sees the patterns and all kinds of things. There are other musicians like that. There are many musicians like that, um, especially the more gifted they are. Stevie Wonder is like that. Um, they, and, and I don't want to. I'm not implying that Stevie Wonder can see patterns in floor tile. He might. He might have a sixth sense because the motherfucker is smart. When I say incredible, I was in awe of what he did one time. But anyhow, um, Ren is very much comes across like that. So I think a combination of all those things might have combined to give him insights and how to put things together so that they connect and resonate um but you know with him being independent the way he was and taking number one in the uk over rick astley over ed sheenan sheenan redheaded acoustic guitar boy you know i can call him boy because i'm way older so Although I'm not, you know, I'm not hating on, on Ed. Uh, and I think the Stones were even, the Rolling Stones were, were up in, in that conversation. And for Ren to do that as an independent, without management, and without touring, without doing shows. None of the traditional rules that the industry would absolutely demand have to be part of. And and when I say industry this time, this time I, I am with you guys. We are talking about corporate suits in an office somewhere. There's no way that they would have signed him and been cool with him getting treatment or whatever. I'm sure someone would have pulled him aside and said, hey, man, you're just going to have to suck it up. And maybe the doctor can go on the road with you or something, but you got to get out there, even if it means your life, you know. Um, but he did something that is should be impossible. But he understood what he was doing on some level. And all I'm doing is my research started long before I knew who Ren was. When I seen... Hi, Ren. It was undeniable. I could see everything that was I had learned 
instinctually or uh, you know it, it's weird because i had these concepts of what it looked like to do it right I'm like oh i'm we're gonna have to do this and that and, but i had never seen in all my years of being around music you know i'd never seen anyone do it right and and i, I don't buy that in a song and in a performance now, ICP also has perfect branding with their brand, with their overall thing. And they've done it somewhat with songs. And I may go through their catalog at some point and be able to find, because I'm thinking back to when I first discovered them, which was Beverly Kills. And there might be a couple songs on there that have per perfect branding uh, as well. But it's in a very different way. And it's a way that doesn't, it's not as universally, universally digestible as Ren is. High Ren is like a magna opus on the human condition. Where ICP, they're for juggalos, you know. They're, it's for their fan base, you know. Um... And they had a lot of haters early on, but I got nothing but love for the Juggalos, man. They, ICP hooked us up back in the day. I've always been grateful for that. Uh, but, so anyhow, let me continue here. So, one of the things that musicians struggle with there, and there, there's quite a few. It, the idea of success. And there, there's this thing that musicians kind of... It, it's like a mathematical equation of, of, of how they perceive success, you know, or how they envision success should happen for musicians. And it's... Get good at your instrument, develop a technical proficiency, go do shows, and the world should find your amazing music and shower admiration, fame, and financial independence upon them. You know, that's the equation. And it's not that at all. That's never been how it works. And I say this as a musician, you know, I want to smash that preconception in every musician and artist that I meet because the art of publicity is 100% artificial. Fame is artificial to what you do as a musician. A lot of top musicians are really miserable, like the Rick Rubin interview where he's talking about musicians spend 20 years doing this thing and it's supposed to solve all their problems and they release it and they realize they're just as miserable now that you know after it's happened than they were before and that's a key thing is it, how fame becomes damaging and i'll give a shout out to another product something that everyone who is a musician should see now i have to give a warning before i recommend this there's a well, the documentary is called Supermatch. It's about Shep Gordon, who was Alice Cooper's manager. And the documentary is kind of laid out like a roadmap on how they broke Alice Cooper and some other acts. Um, and Shep is an amazing person, uh, from this, but he's from a different time period and a different area or a different era, and they had different attitudes about women and. You know, things happen differently. So if you're a female artist or, or a mother or something and, and you want to get this, you know, to see, step back and understand that you're, you're looking at the end of the 60s and 70s attitudes about relationships and rock stars and women. And don't persecute the poor guy because he is giving you some things and as he's evolved he's a much better person you know now than he was then but 
It's an amazing documentary. And he talks about how they created fame for Alice Cooper in that. Different from his success as an artist, but it was intrinsic. And he talks about the damaging effects of it. But one of the key things he talks about is... He met Roger Verge, who was this, I would think, a four-star Michelin chef. Uh, And he ended up learning a lot and kind of becoming an understudy of Roger's. But Roger was the first person that he knew who had fame and success and wasn't damaged by it. And the way Roger got his fulfillment is through the service of other people. And that is something that I took to heart. And it's part of why I decided to come and do this research study and be self-sacrificing of my time, you know, and do this because music needed it. You know, musicians need it. I needed it, which is why I did the homework. But anyhow, fame is an artificial element. Success is a mechanical process that, you know, and mechanical is the wrong word. But it's at being a producer and an engineer, I tend to see things like in a schematic form, and that it's very much a process, you know, the same way that branding is. It functions, there's certain key things, key gears that have to be addressed at a certain point to advance your career. And there's a function to everything. Hence the hot air balloon analogy that I used in the last, you know, um, the last video uh, speaking about how the value, brand value is built up within a market. Um, So... Getting back into this, I want to touch on a couple of the things that have to do with that last post and some of the comments that I got. So... First, I want to talk about everyone, or not everyone, but musician and artist reaction to the term branding and to the business aspect, because I was no different. And I can't stress enough, when I started my academic research, I was a D student. I was a D high school student. I went to a really shitty school in a different era where there was, I mean, they handed out trauma and abuse like they did candy my first grade teacher dug her fingernails into my arms and shook me for picking up a pencil that the girl in front of me dropped and trying to give it just to be nice you know and we went through a totally different era than than a lot of the kids these days um much harsher so i didn't like school i didn't like studying i didn't like anything that had to do with any of this and i remember getting the first couple of books and thinking, okay, here I go. I'm, I'm about to learn a bunch of used car salesman kind of tricks. That's what I was anticipating. Like, this is going to be a bunch of greasy, slimy, uh, slimy kind of thing. Now, I'm going to say what you're all probably thinking right now. I'm going to address it. I'm looking pretty uh, glistening right now. Pretty shiny and slick myself. Well, let me just say, I live in Florida and in in the Orlando area, and it's hot outside, and I've been outside quite a bit today, so I ain't showered and cleaned up and all that, so yeah, I look slick, but I'm also kind of OCD and everything, I hate hair in my face, but I like having hair, and I I go do my tricks on my bike and stuff, so I like slick back, let me dial that stuff in, so I'm not slimy though, I'm a very ethical person, I, I I believe in karma. So let's get on with it. So anyhow, I remember cracking these books open. And the first one I got was Joffrey Moore's Crossing the Chasm. Because I watched him on a Harvard, or he was speaking on a Harvard iLab video. And their iLabs are like 
you know, little workshops and stuff. And he is a consultant for Silicon Valley. And he talked about this book. I'm like, oh, that's interesting. I'll get the book. And this was before I really knew what to do. Because I was basically told by business consultants, hey, man, you got to, you need an MBA. You know, you need the equivalent of one. So I was trying to figure that out. How do I get get this? And I was in total denial about going back to school. So I found it. I'm watching it. I get the book. And I read it. And he talks about the chasm, which is about a gap that occurs in the bell curve of a product's life cycle. And at the early... The early uh, portion of a market's life cycle is for the early adopters and the trendsetters. And there's one appeal that you have to get people to buy into. And the appeal is to be the first because those people are actively seeking you. But once you get those people in, then there's this gap that a lot of businesses, bands and artists, one hit wonders, fall in and they never make it out to get to the other side of the bell curve which is your mainstream market your your laggards and um i think there's one other portion of it that i I can't quite recall but anyhow i remember reading that going oh my god this explains one hit wonders a lot of times now there's many other reasons the road the way the industry operated you know, the lack of faith and, and, you know, a lot of the ignorance that surrounds the industry. But then the next book was Dale Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People. And I think in the next two or three was Martin's branding books and and some others. But with Dale Carnegie that I realized how much trauma I had. I I realized how many bridges I had burnt of my own by growing up in a rough neighborhood where we're brutally, brutally honest about everything all the time. You know, that's not the best philosophy to have. Uh, So... When I got into this academic journey, I realized that this was about legacy. Who do you want to be? Who do you want to be known for with your work beyond, you know, your years? How it's going to stretch out for eternity in the energy that you gave this, you know, world this time. And energy doesn't end. So, depending on the technology, you might be able to grab a molecule and measure, you know, that a dinosaur was mean to its, its buddy, you know, from 100,000 years ago. Because we, it's amazing what we keep being able to figure out and, and track down. So, who knows what is possible, um, ultimately. But, when I went into this journey... I did so thinking that it was going to be exactly what we think business is. A way to trick people out of their money. It was the opposite. It was about going within and figuring out who I wanted to be. But as you go further and further and further with the academic research, what happens, it's very much like... uh, Uh, I think it's Maya Miyashoto. Um, Can't think of his. uh, The Book of Five Rings. Hold on. I'll Google it. I don't want to mess this up. Let's see. Yeah, Miyamoto uh, Musashi, The Book of Five Rings. Um, In that book, he talks about how he was a great, I think, a samurai of Japan, a great warrior. 
But he talks about to become a great warrior, you really have to develop yourself in a lot of different areas. Learn poetry, learn calligraphy, learn this, learn that, because all of it intersects and it creates depth and it's like a spider web that's thrown out and cast out for your your field of understanding and this is what music and musicians lack and this is what is so overwhelmingly present in Ren's music and in his videos and his art so far there is this net of understanding that he is right on the right topic at the right time and he's getting it and that is the thing that I want musicians to walk away understanding about how Ren is setting this example for the industry. Because everything he's doing, you know, man, boy does the, and when I say industry, I mean musicians and producers. And when I say producers, I mean people just like me or, or other little guys on their laptop banging out EDM or hip hop trap beats wherever whatever kind of music you do need to dig, dig deeper and need to get an understanding so one they know how to earn a living but two so they round themselves out and they open themselves up and evolve beyond this narrow field of thinking it's all about money and how to cheat someone over. Another thing about Shep Gordon and the Supermatch movie, he talks about only he only would do compassionate business, which meant he would only do win-wins. And he would... Why do I have a bubble on the screen? I, 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 I don't know if that bubble, that little thumb just popped up on your screen like it did here, but... I didn't, I didn't know it did that. Uh, but it, I, evidently it does. So, But, yeah, compassionate business. And they, another aspect of it is he talks about using coupons, where if someone did something nice for him, he would always repay that favor back. Um, anytime they called or asked, he would just jump on it. And there's a lot of lessons that I took away from that DVD and from Ren. Um, that are just incredible life lessons. They, they hit real hard. Um, you know, I, I can, I can tell you one of the big ones seeing Ren and it was in the back of my mind. I already knew I wanted to learn to play live, but by the time I got probably about 20, 20 Ren videos in down the, down the rabbit hole I was like yeah I'm gonna get a guitar too um you know and that there's other reasons for that mainly I got you know all my BMX I tore my SI joint doing a downside whip over a hip and herniated two disc I can still move around I can still do stuff but if it goes out I'm down for three days but carrying wearing a you know <laughs> carrying this beast back here which is like 70 pounds around you know or sitting at the seat even you know between my toxic mold and my si when i sit there for two hours practicing later that night i'm getting f f entire leg cramps you ever get those calf cramps they're like oh my god like you're running track well i get them in my entire legs both legs same time from the toes all the way up to the hips and it is excruciating. I've even passed out and knocked out walls and stuff like that before. So a guitar is something I can carry around. I can have music with me 24-7 to learn. But that's what something I picked up from watching Ren. I'm like, I've got to be able to perform live. That's the magic in the moment. That's where goosebumps are really, really locked in. When you can perform and create that connection. Um... And then, you know, one other thing that I just want to touch on is Ren is also a master at participatory cultures. 
You get on any Ren video and it, look at the comments and the renegade community, especially with the reaction channels. That's what really got me into them, you know. I, I did... I will say I watched a few Beastie Boys reactions, and I definitely watched some of the uh, um, Ram Jam uh, Black Betty reactions, you know. But that was it. I, I didn't care about, you know, I, I was trying to minimize my time on, on the Internet as much as possible. But seeing, you know, High Ren... That was the first thought I had after I think I watched it twice. I was speechless. But then I, I, what, it, what? I wonder if anyone's reacted to this. You know, jumped online and I started going down the rabbit hole, and it was just like, oh my god, because you want to share that experience. What, what do they think at this part? You know, what do they think at that part? So. It understanding all these aspects and how music should be and could be you know and and there are other issues going on in the music industry that are very important too much in the box relying too much on the computer uh is creating a jaded marketplace and everyone's worried about AI, AI, it's going to replace musicians. No, it's not. It's just like computer graphics. And, and here's one of the George Lucas things. I, you know, in the last video, I said something about Ren being the new George Lucas because his bar is so high. Well, where George Lucas started to get the speed wobbles, you know, like a skateboarder downhilling, and right before he ate the big one with the uh, the prequels, you know, he was impatient with acting. And when he got the ability to start messing with actors' performances and edit them out of sync with what was going on and isolate movement and doing all that, he got even more impatient with the process. And the process of acting was sped through, which is painfully obvious about those prequels. The effects, the sound, the sensory appeal, even the storylines were great. I won't rub in the, the, you know, we all know some of the big, biggest issues with them, and there are many. But he, he did the same thing musicians do. He relied too much on the box, and it didn't translate. We did not feel comfortable with it. As well, one of the things that he did, and, and this is present in Ren's music, and I think Ren can, uh, you know, I don't think he's going to go back and touch High Ren or some of his more profound ones and, and screw it up. But when George started to experiment with the mythology, what he and what Disney don't understand about what they're doing with those films is... <laughs> These aren't movies, guys. This is a belief system. Mythology and stories are what are used to build a civilization. And it would be like having the Bible drop and then saying, oh, no, 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 no. Lucifer is a good guy. He's a good guy. We're going we're gonna to go back and mess with that. Could you imagine if the church tried to pull that right now, what people would do? Same level of freak out. You're not messing with a storyline and a narrative. You are messing with a belief system when you dabble into those elements. That's why understanding branding is so important. You got to understand which gears you're 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 tugging on, and it is something that you know. Again, Ren I think gets on a certain level. Um, but relying on a computer is. I mean, look at me. I, I'm an electronic musician, but I'm trying to figure out how to do as much of it live as possible. I there, Even the last song that I put up, the Halfway Home, I played and sung that live. And it's like an acoustic folk thing, and there's it doesn't come across as electronic at all, because it's really not. But I performed it and sang it live, 
You know, there's only one edit in that whole performance, which came at the end of the vocal take. Um, and it was the very final word that I said. I just said it better on a different take and brought that over. But psh, I did a live one take version of that, at least in the performance. The video is me. It's me showing off on my bicycle. But I didn't go shoot the video for that. There's a long story. But anyhow. Some good writing and some great visuals on that. But there are lots of issues in the music industry right now. And Ren is solving one of them, you know. Or or he's at least giving us an example. I don't want to say he's solving one of them. He's giving us an example about how music has value. And that is the way that he is changing the industry. And I will tell you guys this, when I got into the homework and I realized I read Martin's two books and immediately started looking for research studies on the things that related to the valuation of music and everybody pointed at Napster. Ah, oh, Napster this, Napster. That's everyone's excuse for what happened in music was Napster. It is true. It was the scab. But it is not the disease. It exposed us. Musicians, producers, singers, guitar players, rock musicians. All of the things that we do that alienate us from our marketplace. It exposed how people really feel about our product. And it's saying about Metallica making millions of dollars. All right. Yes, that exists. But this is about every musician being able to earn anything for what they create and dedicate their lives to. And it takes a ton of time to become a great, great level musician. You can't, it's, out, you know, six to ten hours a day of practice to master it. And you can't do that and work a job and have any sort of stable relationship or anything like that. This is where we are. It's We're here now. We can problem solve this. But the biggest thing, the single biggest thing that's going to have to happen from a lot of people is ownership. What can I do to fix it? What problem do I see that I can tackle? What am I going to fix? And uh, let me give you, let me throw one thing out there in, in the rock realm. All right. There's, so one of the rules for pop culture is that the technology that you use dictates your relevance within that marketplace. All right. So if you're using the latest toys and, and digital technology or whatever in a certain way, it makes you relevant to the imagination. It's about the imagination in the kids and in the youth culture and in the emerging culture. And that's really what it's about. It's not about age as much as it is where's the spearhead of the imagination being born, you know. And it's usually in youth. But you listen to like rock musicians. The second I started getting, you know, I or I'm gonna get a guitar. Let me start looking at what you know specific guitars I want to buy and and stuff like that. I started getting bombarded with you know that in my feed, you know, on my YouTube, and I started watching stuff. Every great guitar player you look up to, yeah, this is a 1953, you know, jazz master, you know, oh, look at this, you know, this is a vintage amp, and, you know, I've got this vintage, and it's all about worshiping the past, not sexy to youth culture at all, you know, and in rock, as an engineer and a producer who's worked with rock musicians before, ooh, do they get touchy about what is considered appropriate for genre, you know, tone. And there are some areas where you got, you got to admit, you guys just like thumb your nose at certain things. Look at the, the Fender, uh, or not the Fender, the Gibson... Uh, was it the Thunderbird or Firebird? The one that had all the electronics in it and flopped that they actually ran over with the bulldozer. Guitar players were like, 
screw that. We ain't touching that. But that is exactly it. Now, I do understand there were issues with the execution. There were a lot of bugs, I think, in the work. But there has been, you know, and I know this from years of working, you know, my years at Guitar Center, Hollywood, talking to musicians, you know, gear and stuff. I would see certain rules, you know, you would, or, or certain things, you know, you'd see all the hip hop and pop producers come in, buy the latest, you know, Planet Fad or, you know, the latest Oberheim or, or whatever latest toys came out. And then you would hear them on their upcoming, you know, or, or their latest release. And it, you could tell, all right, so the, the, the sounds and the, the toys dictate relevancy. But it's about keeping that live, you know. And that is an area of ownership that musicians have to be honest with themselves with. When you do your homework, your horizons brought widen. You understand, oh, okay. You would have made that connection on your own. So, like, if I was a rock band right now and you were trying to release a record that was incredible and groundbreaking get a looper you know go get uh reach out to someone who's like you know like a turntablist one of the scratch pickles or someone who's doing something cutting edge with or there's a new toy and just include it on your record like muse did with the what was it the guitar or something uh katana or guitar uh, I can't remember what it's called, but when you use toys, you know, people are like, oh, what's that? Especially if you use them as a musician, there's nothing wrong with that. We do in every other part of our life, you know, we just reject it in certain areas. And the final thing I'm going to say, and then I'm getting off, but we all know this changed everything. And here is the issue. This invention put every musician and really every human being. We are now in constant competition with every mega brand on the planet for attention. That's the name of the game. You're going up against Coke, Nike, Google, Facebook, YouTube, algorithms for everybody who is anyone on you know who's got the money to afford to hire that kind of a department to get people to pay attention to them and this is one of the things that's affecting like youth culture you know like there's a study about how modern youth um i think it was gen z and millennials were having i think up to like 40 percent less likely to hook up and uh, be intimate, you know, um, it, you're competing with people who are branded and who have an understanding at how to connect and resonate. And you are completely in the dark thinking that it should just be magic and it's not. There's things that you can do, but when you don't know what they are, it becomes fingernails on the chalkboard. And this is why I am so thankful for the people who did comment, uh, you know, nothing that anyone said that I take offense to, because I know what it's like to, to see it from that perspective, because that's how I see it, or that's how I seen it prior to cracking a book. I came from the punk rock BMX world. And F that, F all that crap over there, you know. Once I got into it, I was like, oh. And you know what my first thought was? My first thought was, man, why didn't I, why didn't I start reading this stuff when I was 20? I wished. So it is on us. We can change it. And I just want to say, as I get off, I am so thankful uh, to, like I said, Ren, even ICP, and the people who've produced content that have 
shined a light on things. And that's what I hope this is for musicians. And I hope that's what Renegades and other people do with this content is they are able to access it and get a little bit of light and understanding of like, oh, okay, it's not some evil thing. You know, this isn't, you know, the emperor tempting Anakin to turn to the dark side, you know. It is about bringing illumination into your life and allowing you to understand the cause and effect of the things that you can and can't do with your platform. And when you do your homework, man, masterpieces happen. And I hope Bren keeps going with it. And shout out to... Uh, to chinchilla i just seen her one to five i'll tell you guys i don't really want to do reactions um this wasn't planned i was going to do some sort of content i think i'm going to focus any spoken content in more of this direction i'm trying to you know help artists um with some of the knowledge that i've accumulated and shed some light on things like that and then as well as posting my music um, and I may do some kind of like new music, especially live performers, um, who do incredible jobs, uh, with their music and just sharing some music I like. Cause one of the things that I run into is with all of my friends, my age who are in their forties and fifties and whatnot. The, one of the number one things that I hear all the time is, man, there isn't any good music anymore. And I am just scratching my head going, what are you talking about? I can't even keep up. There's so much good music. So much. Speaking of which, Chinchilla... Oh, I already said that. She dropped her 1.5. Now I'm going to say something. I'm going to say something. And I don't want this to be taken the wrong way if certain people hear it. That's one of my favorite songs of hers. I like that song a lot. I really, really do. But I've seen that live performance. And I gotta say, it, now I'm not, not, not a wuss. I'm not gonna freak out. I might freak out a little bit if there was one on me. But I don't like flies. And I don't like cockroaches. And I don't know why she was, you know, she chose that costume. Maybe there's a meaning there and I'm not, it, it's just missing me, but it, it was really rubbing up my my bug phobia there. And I'm like, whoa, what? What are you doing? Why? Why a fly? I, maybe it's just the movie The Fly, you know, when they, uh, what's his name did it? The the newer version that came out was in the nineties. That was some creepiness, man. I I didn't like that, but anyhow. The video is, uh, yeah, it's brilliant. So go check that out, that one to five. And I, I, is it just me? Is it just me? Now, as a BMXer, we get very attuned to judging physical style, or not judging, but recognizing physical style and expression in movement. When I watch that video, I noticed a red Nord synthesizer and I noticed the way a person's shoulders and head looked and, and the way they were trying not to move, but a little bag on his head, kind of, I'm thinking, hey, did Ren fly over and uh, play some, uh, play some piano on this for this performance for her? It's a question, I, you know, question mark. But anyhow, if any of you listen to this, I don't, let me know. Is, is this stuff any good to you guys? Do you, does, do you get anything from this? Because what I'm trying not to do, the last one I felt like I, I kind of went on some, I watched it back and like, oh, I kind of went on some tangents. But it's hard for me to just, you know, give a A to you know, an A, B, C, D drop on this stuff because so many different aspects were relevant to uh, the illumination for me. So I think I'm going to keep doing this. I know I'm going to get better. I'll get more organized with it. I'm just super busy and it's hard for me to really clean, 
yeah, a year from now, if I'm still doing this, I'll have a very dialed system. But peace out, man. And thank you for watching.